From Vermont Public, this is Brave Little State. I'm Burgess Brown. Today we're opening up the BLS archive to revisit one of our wilder episodes. We released it back in 2022. And this story's got all the hallmarks of a classic international thriller. The Cold War, the CIA, dictators, really big guns, like football field-sized guns. It takes place in Barbados and Belgium, in Iraq and South Africa, and at a super-secret cross-border operation in the woods of the Northeast Kingdom. But before we get into this most mysterious chapter of Kingdom history, let's start with some more recent history. Here's Angela Evansy and the rest of the Brave Little State team back in 2022. Hey, morning. Hello. Hello, team. Um... Well, thanks, everyone, for hopping on First Thing Monday. Happy Monday. Those are our producers, Myra Flynn and Josh Crane. This is Team BLS getting ready for an edit and talking about our weekends. Yeah. Game seven. Serious clinching win. Pretty fun. (laughs) I think call all sports sport. (laughs) Yeah, I think you're you're like (laughs) debriefing this game with the wrong crowd, Josh. (laughs) I'm like, oh, we're like, game seven. (laughs) I got to track down Mitch and talk to him about this. Anyway, we love to edit here on the show. Sometimes we do big conceptual edits. Sometimes a producer brings a script that we edit line by line. And sometimes, um, hey, Henry, sorry about the link. Oh, that's okay. We get together with a reporter and they walk us through their reporting so far. Um, so tell me if you can hear this. That's what we did recently with our colleague, Henry Epp. So this is our question asker, Eric Lusher. My name is Eric Lusher and I grew up here in Jay. And so, Angela, you and I actually talked to Eric together. Mm-hmm. Um, he grew up in Jay, Vermont, which is right on the Vermont-Quebec border. It's where uh, Jay Peak Ski Resort is. And when Eric was a teenager, there was this abandoned area in one corner of town. It's off a dirt road, off another dirt road, a ways from Jay Peak and sort of the center of the action in Jay. And this is where Eric and his friends would sometimes go and hang out. Yeah, it was just a, a huge, huge area with all these, all these run down buildings to play paintball in there and do different things and wander around and just try to check things out. And so Eric remembers these neglected buildings that other people had clearly come through and vandalized over the years spray painting stuff or breaking window. You know, it was pretty dilapidated and run down. It's so funny. I feel like every teenager has some version of this type of area, this like overlooked, forgotten place where you can just go and kind of do what you want. Yeah, it feels kind of universal in a way. That was before they put up a big gate in front. This is private property now, all of this area. It's somewhere the property owners really don't want you to go yeah, I think things have changed since then, but um, yeah, yeah, that's what sort of sparked my interest at first. And so what Eric is interested in is something that happened in this abandoned area way before his time. He was a teenager like about 20 or 25 years ago, but 20 years before that was when these vacant buildings were actually being used. And the things that happened there, there's not really a simple way to explain it. But this was an area that used to be home to a sort of secretive business called the Space Research Corporation. And I had heard a little bit about this before uh, Eric's question won this voting round and I started reporting on it. But I didn't know that much. But Eric actually had some really solid background knowledge. From what I know, their founder, Gerald Bull, was uh, pretty insanely smart. And so when we were talking to Eric about his curiosity, he actually kind of knew too much already. Like, if we play more of this clip, um, we'll, he'll kind of give away a lot of the episode. But what you should know up front is that... Uh, It involves a lot of fascinating things, including the space race, the Cold War, giant guns, the length of a football field. It'll also take us to apartheid South Africa and Iraq under Saddam Hussein, and the story ends in an assassination. As you do, Henry. As you do. (laughs) Damn. Is this even real? So Henry played us more of the tape from his reporting. 
And he did such a good job that this edit, this one live take, formed the basis of what you're going to hear today. We also sent a rough cut of the audio to our question asker, Eric Lusher, for a little preview. He really liked it. Henry, by the way, you did amazing work. Like, it felt like that could have taken you forever, or it would take me forever to put together. So big props. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Eric also summed up this story, I think, better than anyone else. It seems like kind of the Forrest Gump of local, local stories. Welcome to Brave Little State, VPR's people-powered journalism project. Here on the show, we answer questions about Vermont that have been asked and voted on by you, our audience, because we want our journalism to be more inclusive, more transparent, and more fun. Today, what's the history of the Space Research Corporation in North Troy, the impact on the local area, and founder Gerald Bull? A chapter of Northeast Kingdom history that is most mysterious. It had a real James Bond quality to it. It was a real super secret. And a man whose talent and ambition led him down a perilous path. Yeah, I mean, the government kind of screwed him over, you know. He just seemed uh, this big bear of a man stumbling around in a world which he never fully understood. We have support from VPR sustaining members. Welcome. Support for Brave Little State comes from Horsford Gardens and Nursery, Charlotte, cultivating native trees, perennials, and fruiting shrubs for planting through the fall. Helping visitors find inspiration with seasonal display gardens. Delivery and planting services available at horsfordnursery.com. And Union Bank, helping Vermonters buy homes, create jobs, and improve communities since 1891. Union Bank, Vermont-based and community-focused. Stay local, go far. UBlocal.com. Well, I'll start um, with my experience of going to this abandoned site. I headed up there uh, to Jay with a man named Scott Wheeler. Um, And we started walking down that road that I described. Are these some of the buildings? Okay. That must be part of the complex up there. And so Scott Wheeler is this local historian, and he's also the publisher of uh, a publication called Vermont's Northland Journal. The Northland Journal is a monthly magazine dedicated to sharing and preserving the history of Vermont's Northeast Kingdom. And I've been at it for 20 years, and and there's probably uh, no more fascinating story in the kingdom that many people, especially newcomers or younger people, have no idea took place here in the kingdom. And so we got up to this this building, and it's standing out, you know, in the woods. And I asked Wheeler to sort of describe what we were looking at. You know, it looks like an office complex, no windows, gray, white. Uh, and it was interesting. Uh, weapons, well, not only weapons of war were created at Space Research, but that was one of the things they created, and somebody has made a a graffiti of a uh, fallen bomb on the side, and it's green. And so this graffiti, there's a cartoonish face on the end of the bomb that's sort of snarling, there are flames coming out around the end, and the weapons that Scott's describing that were made here, they're ultimately the main reason that this place was abandoned over 40 years ago. And to understand why that happened, we have to tell the story of Gerald Bull. So Gerald Bull was born in Ontario in 1928. And from a young age, he was recognized as being quite intelligent. He enrolled in the University of Toronto at age 16, and he received a bachelor's in aeronautical engineering. And by the time he was 23, he had his Ph.D. And in his studies, he became fascinated with the idea of supersonics, basically traveling faster than the speed of sound. 
And so this is all happening in the early 1950s when the space race is just beginning. And there's a growing interest in researching rockets and space flight and all these exciting new ways of, of traveling very fast. And so as he's coming up through school, Bull and his research starts to get recognized by the Canadian government. And so after he's done with his PhD, he goes to work at this place called CARDE, the Canadian Armament Research and Development Establishment, which was near Quebec City. And he's researching missiles and aerodynamics. And this is the beginning of the Cold War, remember. And in 1957, the Soviet Union surprises the whole world, including especially the U.S., by launching Sputnik, the first successful satellite to go into space. You are hearing the actual signals transmitted by the Earth-circling satellite, one of the great scientific feats of the age. And so that spurs more investment from the U.S. and Canada to an extent in Bull's field and into Carde, where he's working. And it's around this time that Bull comes up with an idea, and this idea essentially becomes the obsession of the rest of his life. He believed that you could take a large gun Uh, essentially an artillery piece, and by changing the ballistics of of the gun itself, uh, you could send a satellite into space. This is James Adams. He's a former journalist and an author. He wrote a book about Bull back in the early 90s. It's called Bullseye. And so his innovation here was to use guns rather than rockets to launch things into space. And I'll admit this is where I'm a little out of my depth in terms of the scientific understanding. Uh, So my very simplified understanding is that essentially with rockets, you know, you're launching something up using a lot of fuel and equipment. Essentially, that's really expensive. So instead, Bull's idea is to put a projectile in this very large gun and shoot it into space. So it's not using that same kind of fuel. It's just being pushed up into the atmosphere really, really fast. I'll be honest. I'm sure there's like a lot of really advanced science that uh, went into this idea, but it also just sounds like an idea that like a five-year-old child would have. (laughs) Like, let's just create guns as big as we can and shoot things as far as we can. Yeah, it's that's sort of struck me along this whole whole thing. It's you know, you'd think there was would be a more technical descriptor for this, but what everyone calls it is a just a big gun, a really big gun. (laughs) Um, And so here's here's James Adams again. What he imagined was he would create a something cheaper, faster, repeatable, accessible to large companies, organizations, uh, rich individuals perhaps, and uh, send satellites into space very simply, very fast. And when I spoke to Adams, he made a comparison between Bull and people today like Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, these big personalities with big ideas who want to make space more accessible to more people and who also don't have a lot of patience for red tape or bureaucracy. And Bull is thinking about this at a time, again, when satellites are a pretty new thing. And the idea that more entities could launch their own satellites on the cheap, it would have been pretty revolutionary. But while he has these really grand ideas, Bull also has a reputation for being kind of bombastic. And there are some, especially in the Canadian uh, establishment of the scientific and government communities, who see him as pretty arrogant in a lot of ways. And ultimately, Bull ends up leaving Carde, and he finds a new home for his research at McGill University in Montreal. And that's where he starts a program called the High Altitude Research Project to continue studying this idea of using a big gun to shoot satellites into space. And HARP, uh, High Altitude Research Project, had support from both Canada and from the U.S. military. And it's at this point when his research really starts to take off, so to speak. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) HARP sets up on the island of Barbados, and they build this enormous gun. A 16-inch cannon with a barrel 60 feet long was to be Bull's mammoth test tube. That's a clip from a Frontline documentary that was made about Gerald Bull back in 1991. 
So in 1963, this mammoth gun, which they called Bertha, fired for the first time in Barbados, and it reached 85,000 feet. And and this was a huge deal for Bull. And this was sort of the first time that he had carried out this vision of launching things from a very large gun, and it showed some promise. It wasn't reaching orbit, but it was, you know, reaching really high up, and and he was on his way. And at the same time, the Canadian government starts to get a bit wary of this project, in part because the U.S. military and the CIA are also involved. They are funding this. They have an interest in trying to understand how these satellites could be used uh, specifically for the CIA um, in more military applications. Um, And Canada really doesn't want to support these guns for, for military uses. So eventually, uh, the Hart program at McGill ends in the late 1960s. Bull still, you know, wants to carry out his research. And so he goes private and he creates the Space Research Corporation. And he still has this dream of launching things into space. And so essentially, Bull starts to uh, set up his corporation in both Highwater, Quebec and uh, North Troy and Jay, Vermont. And so now we've reached the point where Vermont comes into this story, although most of the operation of space research is actually on the Quebec side of the border. That's where the guns were located and tested. And these guns were positioned horizontally, so they weren't shooting way up into the atmosphere. Instead, they were shooting directly into the side of a mountain. Hmm. And then on the other side of the border is where most of the administrative side of the business is. That's in Vermont. And that includes the office building I saw with Scott Wheeler. Author James Adams says there were financial advantages for the company to have this facility that crossed the border, both on the U.S. and Canadian side. So you could put stuff in in the north and take advantage of Canada's tax situations, or you could put it through the, from the South and, and take advantage of the U.S. So you, you ended up benefiting from both and, and paying nothing to, to both. And so just, you know, in terms of understanding what this place was like at this time, this is sort of when it was at its height. Um, I talked to Sam Hemingway. He was a, a reporter at the Burlington Free Press uh, in the late 70s. It had a real James Bond quality to it. It was a real super secret, um, you know, this, you got to remember, this is a company that straddled the border. It wasn't just in North Troy. It was in high water Quebec. And, and there was, they, they had free ability to move stuff back and forth bet- over the border. Nobody was really watching. James Bond is kind of an amazing comparison uh, because this whole story feels like almost like the, uh, James Bond if, like, Dr. No were the protagonist. And this is just, like, getting it from his perspective. Yeah, there's a a bit of a mad scientist quality to Gerald Bull and this him having a sort of secretive operation in the woods, you know, I think contributes to that a little bit. I want to back up, though, and talk a little bit about what having this super secretive James Bond operation in the woods in the Northeast Kingdom meant to that area. So we're talking about, you know, very northern Vermont, this corner of the Northeast Kingdom and southern Quebec. And there's not a lot around there. It's a pretty rural community. There's a small town nearby, North Troy. But suddenly there's this big fancy company coming in with a good amount of money, these big guns, and doing really interesting and wild research. And along with that comes engineers, a lot of them from McGill and from other places around the country. And they start hiring local workers as well. Here's Scott Wheeler again. He's the publisher of the Northland Journal who showed me around the area. The thing is, some of the people who work in here... You know, they, this was a dream job because they paid so well. And you're talking about you had engineers and you had ballistics people, but you also had, you know, paper pushers. You had, you know, you had accountants. You had, uh, you know, just various low-level people. But uh, Dr. Bull treated his uh, workers very well from what I understand. And so one of those lower-level workers was a guy named Dennis St. Marie, I live in Mallets Bay or Colchester, Vermont, 
and um, I am fully employed right now with Global Foundries. But back in 1977, he'd just graduated from Champlain College. He had a degree in business administration, and he'd moved back to North Troy, where he grew up, to work at his family's grocery store. The president of the company, Colonel Rogers Gregory and his wife, used to shop at my parents' store in North Troy. And she was talking to her one day and said, uh, do you have any job openings up there? And I guess she must have talked to her husband. Um, and uh, next thing I know, he called me up and said, if you're interested, go up and see this person. And so St. Marie didn't really have any experience with computer operating, um, but that's what he was hired to do. He was hired to be the guy who, who actually used the couple of computers that they had at Space Research Corporation. And we're talking about the late 70s again. So computers at this time were very large. They were about the size of a refrigerator. And, uh, you know, then they had disk drives and stuff like that. And so for this whole sophisticated weapons and, and space operation, Dennis says there were just two computers on the site. One was for administrative and uh, HR Accounts payable kind of stuff, accounting kind of uh, computer, and the other one was for uh, scientific, you know, uh, analysis and stuff when they shot the shells. And Dennis says, you know, coming from North Troy, being someone who grew up there, this was a pretty big deal for the town to have this company there. He said when he was working there, there were about 300 people at the company. And, you know, they did something that a lot of people who are in economic development in Vermont are still trying to do today. You, you hear it all the time, you know, bringing in highly skilled, high-earning professionals into this area from out of state. And that's exactly what Space Research did in North Troy. It was good for the economy. They brought in a lot of money, you know, because they were living there and they had to, you know, have their cars repaired and buy groceries and all that stuff. And when I was up there, I met a woman named uh, Carlene Denton. She owned a grocery store in town, and she saw that firsthand. Was there more activity in town at that time? Oh, yes, yes. Yep. They'd stop in after work and get their newspaper and other things. And so it was good for our business. <laughs> a lot of nice people, too. Very nice people. I'm just going to step in here to say this This sounds great. It sounds like this dude is pretty well set up. He sounds legit. He's got an HR department. So maybe it's like less James Bond and more Breaking Bad because <laughs> it feels like something is slowly looming in the background, like something went wrong. But so far, I have to say, I'm kind of here for this guy. He sounds, uh, he sounds like he did some, I mean, uh, you know, football field size guns aside, he sounds like he was doing some pretty good stuff. Yeah. And, you know, if you talk to people uh, who worked there, like Dennis St. Marie and others, they, they still feel that way. You know, they still feel like he really was a net positive for this community, that he was a, a good person and that he brought a, a level of economic activity to to the town um, that they haven't really seen since, uh, according to Scott Wheeler. North Troy is a nice community, but it's down on its luck and it's trying to pick itself up. It will never probably see the heyday from the space research days. There was one thing about space research's operations uh, in North Troy that did sort of cause a stir uh, with locals, though. And so that was when the company would test its big guns, shooting them again into the side of a mountain. You know, you could hear it and you could feel it for miles around. You could not live here without knowing it was here because people talk about when they fired off the big guns... It would, could knock knickknacks off your stands. Can you tell me about that? What was that like? <laughs> well, you wondered if your uh, shelf of cups and saucers were going to fall off the wall or not, but they never did. But that was, yeah, you noticed it went off. <laughs> this feels really reminiscent of something that is happening in Vermont right now. <laughs> I was just going to say this is yes. kind of putting the F-35s to shame. <laughs> Definitely an auditory precursor. Yes. Yeah, definitely some some parallels there. Um, but, you know, besides these occasional, you know, rumblings uh, throughout the town, the company seemed to get along quite well with uh, the local community. Um, and the people who worked there say they really liked the management. Um, I actually spoke with Bull's former secretary, um, 
who did not want audio to be played, but she said, uh, you know, Bull was a nice man. She did say he was colorful, demanding, but understanding. And she still feels really loyal to him uh, to this day, even after many things that that went on uh, in his life, which we will get to in a moment. When we come back, the things that went on in Gerald Bull's life, here in Vermont and abroad. This is Brave Little State. Thanks to Vermont Fish and Wildlife for their support of Brave Little State. Vermont Fish and Wildlife, conserving our grasslands with public support through the Vermont Habitat Stamp. Learn more at vtfishandwildlife.com. Welcome back to Brave Little State. I'm Angela evans Today, Henry Epp is talking us through the answer to a question from Eric Lucher about the Space Research Corporation in Vermont's Northeast Kingdom and the fate of its founder, Gerald Bull. So to recap, um, Bull is considered a good employer. He's respected in the community. He brought jobs to this remote part of the NEK and Quebec But let's step back and and talk a little bit more about what his company was actually doing. Bull was still holding on to this dream of using his large guns to launch satellites. But by the late 60s and early 70s, it was clear that there was not going to be a market for that. I think along with Vietnam and other things, the you know, United States kind of lost interest. And um, so the, 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 the grants dried up. Space research had all these brilliant people, but they couldn't, you know, the, the gun was was not going to make them any money. So that's Sam Hemingway again, the former Burlington Free Press reporter. And it's around this time that Bull then starts to turn to more traditional applications for gun technology, which is artillery and weaponry. There'd always been some military interest in the research that he was doing from the Army and the CIA. They had helped fund him all the way back to the HARP days. And even though he still had dreams of space, it was clear that artillery technology was where the money was for Bull. Essentially making smaller guns uh, relative to the to the football field size guns uh, shoot farther. And so Bull began to market that technology and he found buyers. It was never clear to me that he really understood the, the world in which he had kind of accidentally entered. Uh, author James Adams says that Bull, as he got into this world of, of weaponry, was really out of his depth. Someone... I mean, kind of comes with a bag full of money and says, hey, Jerry, uh, we love you. You've got some stuff, got some technology. Would you like some cash? And the first uh, was the Israeli government, which Bull sold artillery shells to, and they were actually used in the Arab-Israeli War in 1973. And so while he had not given up on his dreams of space, by the mid-70s, Bull was really solidly in a different field, which was weapons manufacturing and dealing. Along came South Africa, and they were willing to, of course, pay a premium for what was really a black market product. So again, Sam Hemingway, reporter at the Burlington Free Press. And Hemingway spent about two years reporting on space research almost exclusively in the late 70s and early 80s. And as you said, South Africa comes along and suddenly they're interested in space research's artillery systems. And for context here, we need to remember what was going on in South Africa at this time. So in the late 70s, Um, South Africa is in the full throes of apartheid, which was this systematic segregation of everyone in South Africa who was not white by the minority white ruling class. And that meant non-white South Africans were made to live in areas separate from whites. They were shut out of political representation. They lost their South African citizenship. It was this brutal regime. Um, 
And this was opposed by much of the international community, uh, including the U.S. And one way of opposition uh, to apartheid uh, was in 1963, many Western countries endorsed a U.N. arms embargo against South Africa, meaning that they could not sell weapons to the South African government. But South Africa in the late 70s was also fighting a war in Angola against uh, Marxist rebels. So again, this is during the Cold War, and the Soviet Union is supporting the Marxists. And the U.S., meanwhile, is sort of doing two things at once. So while we were endorsees of the embargo, there was a lot of funny business going on underneath. So Henry, can I just jump in and clarify here? Mm -hmm. So this is apartheid South Africa, which the U.S. and the U.N. oppose, uh, do not want to support what they're doing in their own country. But at the same time, it's the Cold War, and South Africa is fighting uh, in Angola against an entity that the Soviet Union supports. And so the U.S. doesn't want the Soviet Union to win that. And so we're also kind of simultaneously supporting South Africa in that part of what's going on in the world. Yeah, that's right. Okay, cool. Thank you. But doing so in a sort of covert way, including sort of allowing arms shipments like the ones that space research was doing to go forward. Um, And of course, the other effect of that is they are arming the apartheid South African government. So Sam Hemingway says he, uh, you know, is reporting in Vermont. He's looking for a story. He sees a CBC documentary about some questionable arms shipments that were made from space research to South Africa. And he starts looking into the story and enlists another reporter named Scott Malone to work on it with him. And so they start developing sources and they look into documents and they start to track these shipments of artillery shells from places like Antigua and New Brunswick. The last one, I think, went out of Montreal on this little tramp steamer that had no business crossing the Atlantic. But it was, you know, it was a way to avoid detection. They had all this false paperwork to say it was going here when it was actually going there. And so one by one, we were able to find out about these shipments. And so it's sort of that, like, drip, drip, drip. And and, uh, Sam Hemingway is is reporting stories on this frequently. And we found out that South African generals had visited the uh, uh, compound up at North Troy. That was interesting. And they found out that space research officials had visited a military base in South Africa, and they figured out who exactly went on that trip. I mean, I'm saying we figured this out. We figured this out because we'd started, we developed some really good and deep sources, both within the company and within the government and within the uh, customs service. So Sam Hemingway is reporting these stories in the newspaper about these questionable arms shipments. And at the same time, uh, Gerald Bull gets interviewed by a British reporter about some shipments that were supposed to have gone to Spain. We've been told they were re-exported out of Spain on a ship called the Brizan, and it gave its destination as Canada. Only guess what? Where did it go? South Africa. South Africa. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We, I, I haven't got it. We'll certainly check it. It really helps to see the visual of this clip because you can just tell how sort of uh, uncomfortable Gerald Bull is in this interview when he's being questioned about these deals. Um, so then at the same time, there's this customs agent in Vermont uh, who Sam Hemingway and his co-reporter were talking to. He's named Larry Curtis. And he was also investigating these questionable shipments that space research was making. And by the accounts I've heard, Curtis was just very dogged in his job. He was really being thorough in this investigation. And eventually, that leads to a federal grand jury being seated in Rutland, which Sam Hemingway, as a reporter, would stake out. And he was able to go sit in this hallway as the grand jury was meeting, and he would watch witnesses come in and out every day. I might have no idea what's being said in the room. Um, But all I know is I can see the grand jurors go in the room, the door closes, and then I can see an assistant or or head U.S. attorney for the state uh, escort somebody into the room um, and close the door. And then at some point later on, they come back out. I would time how long they were in there and I'd have a story to say 
this or that person who I know who they are testified today before the federal grand jury about the space research, you know, arm scheme. So this, uh, the court investigation happens, and eventually uh, Gerald Bull and Rogers Gregory are indicted for violating the U.N. arms embargo. Um, but Larry Curtis, the customs agent who'd been investigating this case, he'd found evidence that it was not just space research that was in on these deals. Um, here he is uh, speaking to Frontline back in 1991. We were talking about indicting 15 individuals. I believe three countries and five corporations. And then he's surprised to find out and disgusted to find out that only Gerald Bull and Rogers Gregory were going to be indicted in in this whole operation. I was told uh, that the reason we never went any further was because there had been a phone call from the White House. I took that to mean there had been a phone call from the White House to Maine Justice stating, don't go any further with the investigation. And Gerald Bull and Rogers Gregory worked out a plea agreement. And according to Frontline, what this essentially meant was that they did not go to trial. This this plea agreement happened just before the trial was supposed to happen, which could have led to uh, allegations against the CIA's involvement coming out in, in open court. And that didn't happen. Um, but there's pretty good evidence that the CIA was supportive of arms shipments to South Africa. Uh, here's author James Adams. You know, there isn't a piece of paper that says, go forth, uh, Mr. Bull, and multiply. But the fact of the support of the intelligence community and part of the defense community for South Africa was very well known. So it sounds like they made Gerald Bull and Space Research Corporation take the fall. Effectively, yes. So Gerald Bull and Rogers Gregory reach this plea agreement with the government. Uh, No indictments are leveled against anyone else. And Bull and Gregory admit uh, guilt to some charges and they're sentenced to just a few months in prison. But still, Gerald Bull felt like he had been betrayed by the government and he was livid. Uh, Sam Hemingway, the reporter, was in the courtroom when he was sentenced. Uh, bull at sentencing was started getting kind of angry and started coming toward me and some of his people with him kind of like kind of calmed him down because he was pretty worked up he was just had been told he's going to jail it was pretty intense So Gerald Bull is sentenced in June of 1980. And back in the Northeast Kingdom, space research employees like Dennis St. Marie were just getting word that they might be out of a job for a while. Yeah, yeah. They came around and says, uh, you know, we're running into some issues with the government and we got to work it out. And, you know, we're going to temporarily close and we'll let you know when we reopen. And, you know, they they kind of gave you a hope that, you know, you'd be back maybe in a couple weeks or something like that. But then those few weeks turned into the whole summer. So I went back to work at my parents' store, um, you know, to, to help out and stuff. And um, in the fall, late fall, I decided I wanted something different. St. Marie got a job at IBM in Essex Junction. And while some other space research employees attempted to create offshoots of the company in other locations, uh, the compound in North Troy and Highwater ultimately closed around this time. And that left it to slowly decay into what it is today, these abandoned uh, spots in the woods. So now we're in the early 80s, and Bull serves his four-month prison sentence at a relatively upscale prison in Pennsylvania. But despite his plea deal, Bull maintained through the rest of his life that he was innocent and had essentially been made to be a scapegoat by the U.S. government. And when he gets out of prison, he's bitter and he does not want to work with the U.S. or with Canada anymore. And so he heads to Brussels, Belgium, where he'll spend the next 10 years of his life. And author James Adams told me that Brussels was considered the arms-dealing capital of the world at this time. So here's this ballistics guy who is known to be angry, uh, alienated, nowhere to turn, but has got a uh, a lot of knowledge. So he's attractive. And uh, who he's attractive to are 
more countries who want his technology and his expertise in artillery. And that includes countries like China, Adam says, and also the government of Iraq, which was under dictator Saddam Hussein at the time. And so it's around this time in the 80s when Bull has become just a full-on arms dealer living in Brussels uh, that he makes a deal with Saddam Hussein, uh, who agrees to bankroll his pet project, Bull's pet project, the super gun, this huge gun to launch satellites into space. And, and Bull sells him on it. The sell was uh, you will be able to, uh, you, Saddam, will be able to lead the Arab nations in putting satellites into space. So you, you'll lead the space race. It'll be um, glory to the, the people of Iraq kind of a thing. But Saddam Hussein was also working on other things during the 1980s. Namely, he was trying to start a nuclear weapons program. How much Bull knew about that is uncertain, I think. Um, he's not a nuclear guy. Um, would he have known the extent of Iraq's nuclear program? Absolutely not. It's still, Bull is desperate for money at this time, and he wants to see his vision come to life. So throughout the 1980s, he's working with Saddam toward building a super gun. And Adam says eventually, intelligence agencies, including in Britain, the U.S., and in Israel, start to get wind of this project. For the Israelis, the concern was, here's this guy, he's building this huge gun. It brings uh, all of Israel within firing range from Iraq. And we, Israel, are very concerned about their nuclear program. So we take this extremely seriously. And we therefore need to think about how we address the problem. So, addressing the problem. On the evening of March 22nd, 1990, Gerald Bull takes the elevator up to his sixth floor apartment in Brussels, and he walks to his door and begins fumbling for his key. Then a person walks up behind him and with an automatic pistol with a silencer, fires three shots into his back. And Bull falls and hits the door. The killer fires two more shots into the back of his head. And Bull has been killed. Good evening. On March 22nd, in Brussels, a Canadian businessman named Gerald Bull was killed as he approached the doorway of his apartment. They found his briefcase with $20,000 in it inside, and the key was still in the door. It wasn't like this was a break-in. This was an assassination. Again, this is Burlington Free Press reporter Sam Hemingway. And so this is 10 years after he did all this coverage of Bull's arms deals and sentencing. And he gets back on Bull's story along with his co-reporter Scott Malone. And they also enlist uh, an Israeli journalist who had sources within the Mossad, which is Israel's intelligence community. So we did do a piece that said, you know, the Mossad was the leading candidate for the assassination of Gerald Bull. And um, that's about as best as we could do. There isn't really an answer here in terms of who killed Gerald Bull. But like Sam Hemingway said, there's a lot of suspicion that it was uh, the Israeli Mossad because they had these reasons uh, to want Bull dead, right? They did not want him and Saddam Hussein to complete the supergun project, which threatened uh, Israel. There are other theories... uh, But, you know, in the end, what it meant on a sort of geopolitical level was that uh, Saddam Hussein's weapon system, the super gun, was no longer because Gerald Bull was dead. I'm just so fascinated by, like, this dynamic you're describing, Henry, where what you're saying is Gerald Bull was he was so committed throughout his career to building this super gun for the space race purportedly and and he makes this deal with saddam hussein and he's like yeah this is going to help me get funding to build this super gun and saddam hussein's like oh yeah sure the super gun but like actually has a totally different aim for it much more nefarious like could bull really not square that like i was thinking that too yeah i'm like do you just turn a blind eye to saddam hussein (laughs) Yeah. And like, and to me, this is like the fascinating tension of who Bull is. Is he or who he was? 
Was he a super genius, starry-eyed scientist with grand aims for sort of advancing our space technology? Or was he someone who was just willing to do business with anyone? And I, I really, it feels so hard to like land on one side or the other of who he was. Yeah. And I think it's, it's complicated, right? I think um, by the accounts I've heard and, and the people I spoke to, you know, he really was brilliant in a lot of ways in his scientific knowledge and that he did really hold on to this idea of launching things into space. But he also, particularly after he served his prison sentence, there is a turn in his sort of attitude and mentality, right? That he he feels really wronged by uh, the two countries that he had called home for a long time, Canada and the U.S. He feels like he has been spurned by them. And so there's, you know, maybe a little bit of of a retribution angle here. And the other thing to bring in here is that, you know, right around the time of his death or or shortly after um, is the first Gulf War in Iraq when uh, the U.S. and other allies uh, go in and and fight uh, Saddam's army as they're invading Kuwait. What they're up against in those battles is in part technology and artillery that Gerald Bull developed and sold to Saddam Hussein. The artillery that Saddam had in that war was stronger and could shoot farther uh, and in some ways was better than what the U.S. was using, in part because of Gerald Bull and the technology that he had sold Saddam Hussein. But, uh, you know, something that James Adams really pointed to, he sees Gerald Bull as this man who was just out of his depth. He saw arms dealing as a means to an end to create that system that he thought would revolutionize access to space. But he just showed a lot of naivete in in the whole thing. He just seemed uh, this big bear of a man stumbling around in a world which he never fully understood. And... That world of guns and bullets and spooks is is not for the faint of heart. And you've got to be pretty wise to the world. And he never struck me like that. It's a cautionary tale. Um, you know, sup with a long spoon if you're dealing with... Uh, people in who live in the darkness and um, and I think a cautionary tale too that in, in the sort of psychology sense of how people who can be brilliant in one one part of the of the world can be hopelessly naive in another part so you know, that's essentially the the story of of Gerald Bull, but there are some other sort of threads here um, that that are interesting, and and I think uh, I'd like to sort of go over. So so first, there's the local angle. What what did it mean that he was here in in Vermont? Uh, Scott Wheeler, uh, the local historian, you know, he really laid out sort of the that main contrast of Gerald Bull and, and his role in the Northeast Kingdom. You know, his weapons of war. Let's be real. Uh, his weaponry, his munitions, they kill people. There's, there's no sugar coat in that. I'm talking from a local level, he was, he was a very good employer. But from a world level, you know, he, he played in a tough business. And it cost him his life. For Dennis St. Marie and others who worked at Space Research, they still think that Bull was really wronged and and was, you know, made to be a scapegoat by the government. Yeah, I mean, the government kind of screwed him over, you know, um, in that respect. But him playing with Hussein wasn't really nice either. So, I mean, I don't don't give him much credit for that, you know, and and that kind of was his demise, you know. But Dennis, at the same time, is really grateful for this opportunity that he got 40 years ago. I think it really helped grow my career um, to really focus on IT and computers, which I didn't do before at, at Champlain or, or um, you know, working in my, local, my parents' grocery store. He eventually went on to work at IBM, uh, which became Global Foundries. He's still there 40 years later. It all started there. 
You know, I also asked reporter Sam Hemingway, you know, how he sees the story now. And and one thing that he really pointed to, which I thought was interesting, was that he wishes he'd focused a bit more on why this story mattered in the first place, which was apartheid in South Africa. And the fact that this company in northern Vermont was breaking a U.N. arms embargo to send weapons to this government that was discriminating against and suppressing the majority of its people. I kind of wish I had examined that part of the story in more detail so that people could get the context of why this is so darn important. Why are we paying all this attention to space research? Because they were doing something basically to fortify the advocates of apartheid, you know, and, and that, I didn't, I don't think I hit that, that nail hard enough. And then, so, you know, finally, Unfortunately, we hear about artillery and weapons technology in the news these days, particularly in Ukraine. And and I was curious, you know, going into this story, is there a legacy there of of the technology that Gerald Bull came up with that's being used in in Ukraine uh, right now? And James Adams, who wrote a book on Bull and has uh, done a lot of reporting and research around the military and and weapon systems, he says that Bull's legacy really does not live on in that technology. And the sort of ironic thing is that if he had actually been able to carry out his dream of, of launching things into the space, his legacy might have been very different. You can't say today, that's a Bull piece. Well, that was that was Jerry. He did that. Um, no, it all just got lost in the in the general mix of things. And so, for a, a guy who who started off with with so much promise and and, and vision, it, it's kind of a sad headstone on, on his grave to say that. Well. How much did any of that matter? Uh, Not much, really. I mean, life goes on. Brave Little State originally released this episode back in 2022. At the time, Dennis St. Marie, former employee of the Space Research Corporation, was working at Global Foundries. He's since retired. Thanks again to Eric Lusher for the great question. Henry Epp reported this episode, and it was produced by Angela Evansy, with additional editing and production by Myra Flynn and Josh Crane. This encore presentation was produced by me, Burgess Brown. Ty Gibbons composed our theme music, other music by Blue Dot Sessions. Special thanks to Anna St. Marie, Kevin Trevelin, Mark Davis, Michael Rogers, Kate Phillips, and Paul Carnahan. Brave Little State is a production of Vermont Public. If you like our show, you can make a gift at bravelittlestate.org slash donate, or leave us a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. We'll be back soon with more listener-powered Vermont journalism. Until then, I'm Burgess Brown. Thanks for listening. New from the Embedded Podcast. Female athletes have always needed grit and talent. But for decades, they've also needed a certificate. There was chit-chat about, is that really a woman? And even now, they're still being checked and questioned. Their story is the newest series from CBC and NPR's Embedded. It's called Tested. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.